Welcome to a very special presentation of the novel A Really Good Day by James Hosek. On its surface, it's a story about a remarkable round of golf. But if you're not a golfer, if you quickly change the channel, if you accidentally come upon a tournament on TV, I encourage you to listen anyway. It's a story about family and friendship. It's a story about redemption and second chances. It's a story about promises made and promises kept. It's a story about once-in-a-lifetime experiences. But most of all, it is one man's love letter to his family. That man was my brother, the author, James Hosek. Aside from being an amazing veterinarian, woodworker, gardener, husband, father, brother, son, and friend, he was a writer. Writers are often told to write what they know. And in this, his first book, he did that in more ways than I can count. It will make you laugh, it will make you cry, and it will make you stand up and cheer. So sit back and enjoy as Jim takes you on a fun, entertaining journey through 18 holes of golf and one man's really good day. Prologue. The day ends. It was a crazy idea. It was insane. It was stupid. Why even consider it? No one here was going to blame him if he made the safe choice. A nice easy five wood to the halfway point, then on the green in two. A two putt would ensure him the win. That was what a smart golfer would do. That was what a sane person would try for. How far? asked Scott Hanover. His friend and caddy, Paul Bauer, looked a little confused. How far what? How far over the water? To the green? asked Paul. That's crazy. I know. That's insane. I know. It's stupid. Exactly, Scott agreed. How far? Paul answered without hesitation. 315 yards. Scott took a deep breath and held his club out to Paul. Get me my driver. Paul chuckled and took it. You're an idiot, he said with a big grin. No argument here, agreed Scott. Paul slipped the club into the bag and pulled out Scott's driver. Over the club head was a gopher doll holding a plastic golf ball. Scott took the club with the cover on it. A murmur began rippling through the crowd. He knew everyone was thinking the same thing. This guy is going for it. Scott raised the club over his head, and a cheer broke out. Go for it, they shouted. On the green. A group of guys who maybe had snuck some alcohol into the forest preserve started singing. I'm all right. Nobody worry about me. Why you gotta give me a fight? Can't you just let it be? The words and music from the Kenny Loggins song that graced the closing credits of the movie Caddyshack spread through the mass of people like wildfire. Scott bounced his driver with the gopher cover to the beat, feeling a surge of adrenaline flowing. This was his day. His moment. The day hadn't started out like this. Seven hours ago, he was just a low-ranked amateur wondering how he'd even gotten into this whole mess. Now the whole world was watching and holding their breath with him, wondering just how it was going to end. He returned to the tee, pulled the cover from his club, and turned 45 degrees to his left to face the flag on the distant green. His right arm held the driver outstretched, lining up his shot. As if on cue, the singing and clapping from the crowd faded away and was replaced by an awed silence. As he drew back the club, starting the motion that would end with his ball leaving the tee for the last time that day, everything seemed to go in slow motion. His backswing, the uncoiling of his body, the ping as his driver hit the ball. 
he found himself facing the far-off green with his club hanging over his left shoulder. His ball lifted higher and higher, further and further. No one spoke. No one breathed. One way or another, this day came down to this one shot. Chapter 1 The Day Begins Scott had never been a morning person. The only thing that could get him out of bed this early was an equally early tea time. Looking out the bedroom window at the approaching sunrise, he wondered why he had never just taken time to enjoy this moment of the day before. He turned and looked at the glowing red numbers on his alarm clock. He had been standing at the window for ten minutes. It hadn't felt that long. The truth was, he should be excited. But all he was feeling was the biggest case of nerves he ever had, and some well-deserved guilt. One week earlier, he had been informed that his alternate status in the regional tournament of the Northern Illinois Amateur Golf Association was being upgraded to active. Joe Culkin, the golfer who originally had the spot, had broken his wrist chopping wood. It wasn't that Scott had played all that well, but he had an amazing putt on the 18th hole that put him in third place, until the disqualification of the second-place finisher for having an extra club in his bag moved him up. Now he found himself not only having to prepare to compete with the top local amateur golfers in Chicago, but also trying to convince his wife that it was the absolute last time he'd play before their child was born. He had promised the same thing before the previous tournament, convinced he would go no further. Sarah eventually relented and allowed him this last fling before the delightfully terminal condition of fatherhood overtook his life. Scott, muttered the soft voice of his wife from the bed, what time is it? 6.45, he answered. You can go back to sleep. No, I can't, she said. Being pregnant means having to go to the bathroom all the time. Didn't I explain this to you already? Right. Come to think of it, you did, he replied. She slipped out from under the sheets and went down the hall. The sky had brightened, and the room was bathed in the glow of early morning. After a few moments... Sarah's arms slipped around his waist from behind, and she nestled her chin on his right shoulder. Scott tilted his head back so that their cheeks touched. You're sure you'll be okay? he asked. Hey, she chided. You were the one begging to go. Getting cold feet? I don't belong out there, he answered. You'll have fun, she assured him. You and Paul will go out and do your golf thing for five hours, grab a beer, and still get home in time to get started on that list of things we need to get done before the baby comes. Scott cringed at the last part. But she was right. They would have fun. Scott and his friend Paul Bauer couldn't help but have fun when they were on the golf course together. Scott snuggled closer to his wife. These guys I'll be playing with today all shoot par. I've only broken 80 twice. 80 sounds good, said Sarah. Scott smiled at her comment. Par is usually 72 for 18 holes, and this is a tough course. Paul and I played there last year, and I think I shot a 95. I just hope I don't embarrass myself. Sarah pulled away and grabbed his hand. Come back to bed. It's cold in there without you. I don't think I can sleep. Then just lay next to me. Scott turned to face her. He kissed her lightly on the lips and let her lead him back to bed. She muttered in a half-sleepy voice, In half an hour, I'll make you a good breakfast and you can go play with your friend Paul. You'll do fine. Scott snuggled up behind his wife, reached over her pregnant belly and took her hand. She was asleep in less than a minute. He listened to her slow, even breathing. His apprehension returned without Sarah's reassurance. 
Hopefully, he could keep his score to no higher than 90. That was just one over par every hole. That would be a score he could live with. Sally, screamed Jason Bernard over the noise of the shower. There was no immediate response, so he shouted louder, turning his wife's name into two distinct syllables. Sally, where is my green tie? What? she finally shouted in return over the rushing water. My green tie. I can't hear a word you're saying, she shouted back. Never mind, he returned. What? Never mind, he shouted again, louder. Jason looked through the closet again, searching through each one of the hundred or so ties in his collection. Not that it mattered that much today. Lucy Pendle had been assigned to cover the Chicago Marathon. Both baseball teams were out of the playoffs, so it was the top sports event in Chicago today, and Jason wasn't going to be there. With a lot of the best marathoners running, it was going to be as much of a psychological race as a physical one. They expected a fast start, and for one of the runners to set a world record. Jason had covered the marathon for the last five years for the USA Sports Channel in Chicago. This year, he was condemned to reporting on an amateur golf tournament in the south suburbs. He wouldn't even have any live reports, just a video camera and one cameraman. He'd then have to spend the afternoon editing the whole six-hour ordeal into a one-minute, twenty-second segment to be aired on the nine o'clock report. Lucy Pendle had been hired to try to widen the sports network's female demographic. There were some rumors she had slept her way to the marathon assignment. She was very attractive and young, but Jason had been assured that since marathons were as much as a woman's sport as a man's, the execs thought it might boost their ratings and not to worry. Big things were in line for him. If this was their idea of big things, Jason was seriously considering putting on one of his wife's dresses. What's more, he hated golf. Not only was it boring, but only the wealthy could afford to play the really nice courses. He personally didn't even consider it a sport. The idea that people would use carts to drive from shot to shot just seemed to prove his point. He found the green tie he was looking for hanging on the last hook. It was still stained from tomato sauce. He had meant to have it cleaned the last time he wore it. Instead, he grabbed a red tie with gray diamonds. The shower had stopped and Sally came back into the bedroom. Did you find it? she asked. Find what? he replied, distracted by trying to knot the tie around his neck. The green tie? She ruffled her hair with a towel as she said it, bending over to let the long blonde strands hang straight down. The towel wrapped around her chest barely covered her behind in this position, and Jason took the opportunity to whack her sharply on the butt. Can't hear me, my eye, he muttered, not too softly. His whack caused her to squeal as she stood up, her hair flipping back to reveal her sinister grin. Despite her nasty prank, he allowed himself to become infected by her beautiful smile. She looked at him and shook her head, watching him trying to tie his tie. What would you do without me? she asked. She took the tie from his hands and undid his loose knot. She pulled the tie under his collar and expertly knotted it, snugging it tight around his neck. You're going to be late, she admonished, quickly kissing him. Doesn't matter, he replied. Just that silly golf tournament. Oh, is Tiger Woods playing? <laughs> no, he chuckled. Just amateurs. But the winner gets a chance to play in a pro-am PGA event. The station thought it would be nice to get some coverage of a local guy who would go to play with the professionals. Are you going to be gone all day? Pretty much. I might make it home by 7 o'clock. It really depends on what cameraman I get and how good he is. Elf is going to be at the marathon. I have no idea who I'll be assigned today. 
Alf Redding was Jason's usual cameraman on his assignments. Lucy Pendle had insisted on him for the marathon, and Jason felt it wouldn't be fair to force Alf to suffer at the golf tournament, too. Well, don't think I'm going to be having any fun at the rummage sale. I'll be haggling with people over 50-cent coasters and trying to keep Cecily Waterston from putting too high a price on some of the tchotchke we've collected. She slipped into her walk-in closet to pick out a dress, her towel tossed out behind her. Jason looked at his watch and frowned as he saw he was going to be late. I gotta go, he called after her. She peeked her head around the doorway. Are you sure? she teased. Yeah, I'll be late, but tonight... You know, we really need to talk about something related to that, she began. Here it comes again, thought Jason. Sally, there's too much pressure at work now. With me losing the marathon assignment, I have to work even harder to keep my position. I know you want kids, sweetheart. It's okay, Sally sighed. Jason felt the disappointment in her voice. He had put her off for years and could tell she wasn't in the mood to fight about it now. We'll talk tonight, he promised. All right, she answered. The door of the walk-in closet closed behind her. Jason looked at his watch. He knew she was in there crying, frustrated by his delays in starting their family. He wanted to go in and hold her, but knew she hadn't pushed the issue as hard as she wanted. She was patient, but he wasn't sure how much longer that would last. His job required him to work most weekends, and vacations were short and far between. But he wanted to make sure his job was stable before he made the commitment to raise a family. Wasn't that important, too? He checked his watch again. He had to leave. There was no time now to spend on the long conversation he knew was ahead. He would make it up to her tonight. Flowers, chocolates, and reservations at Morton's. Maybe in a year he'd feel confident enough to start a family. Things would be better then. Andrew Patterson sat comfortably in his leather wing back chair. An unlit pipe hung from the corner of his mouth. In his left hand, he held one of his Pierre Cardin golf shoes. With his right, he carefully dabbed a dull spot with some kiwi shoe polish and carefully buffed the shine back. He had already tightened the spikes and evened out the laces. Perfection graced his every endeavor. He could conceive of nothing that would deny him a victory today at the Northern Illinois Amateur Regional Golf Tournament at the George W. Dunn Championship Golf Course. Andrew Patterson had achieved success in everything he pursued. He worked hard to get where he was. He had obtained his MBA from the University of Chicago and had used his business expertise to start a software company, then a property management firm, and most recently an internet consulting group. Two years ago, he decided he needed something different. He wanted more recognition for his accomplishments. He wanted a certain degree of fame. Not to the point where he couldn't walk outside without some photographer harassing him, but more where people might recognize him on the street and solicit an autograph. He settled on golf as the perfect vehicle for this goal. It required skill and athleticism, but not the physical stamina required of other sports. It was something he could work on and perfect with his usual approach. He researched the game thoroughly, sought out the top golf instructors and the best equipment. Then he practiced until his body and mind had united to produce a consistent swing. He analyzed the technical factors of the game, when to use a particular club, how to read a course, and most importantly, how to manage it. He perfected every aspect of the game. Today would be the culmination of his efforts. If he won, he would have a chance to play in a PGA Pro-Am tournament. If he did well enough, the prospect of turning professional would not be all that distant. As a professional golfer, he would be in a position to obtain the fame he desired. He set down his shoe, 
leaned deep into the chair and sighed. He looked at his desk on which sat his putter. It was like no other golf club ever made. The head was a solid piece of jade. The shaft was gold-plated. Next to it were a dozen of his personalized Callaway Tour golf balls and a bag of 18 wooden tees. Andrew had been over the course in person several times, and in his mind hundreds of times. He knew which holes to go for it on, and which to play it safe for par. He wasn't a gambler on the course, and he had every shot mapped out in his head. If all went as planned, he would shoot five under par for a total of sixty-seven. Of course, there was always the possibility he might sink some long putts he hadn't planned on, place a few approach shots close enough to the pin for a tap in birdie, but a sixty-seven would win the tournament. His only major competition, Joe Calkin, had carelessly injured himself and was out of the running. He could taste the victory. It would be so easy. No one else was in his league. He stood and placed his golf shoes carefully into a gym bag. On the desk, beside the golf balls, was the enlarged course layout he had scanned from a scorecard. Every shot was clearly marked. Tee shots in blue, fairway shots in green, and putts in red. Every club was noted. He had a printout of the National Weather Department forecast. Low winds, 5 to 10 miles per hour from the southwest. Temperatures in the high 60s to low 70s. A beautiful fall day. To celebrate, he planned on taking his fiancée, Cecily, to dinner at the Palmer House. She never attended his tournaments. He was quite sure she would be terribly bored. Besides, she had promised to help out with the rummage sale at her church. He picked up his putter and carefully wiped a few fingerprints from the shaft with cheesecloth before sliding it into the velvet case Cecily had fashioned for him. He fastened the snaps over the head and slid it gently into the center of his golf bag. Next, the balls and tees went into their own compartment. Andrew smiled to himself. Very few things he could think of required such attention to detail and reliance on everything going perfectly as golf. That was why he loved it. Today would be perfect. Jake Fisher fumbled for the crumpled pack of camels on his nightstand. In the process, he knocked off the nearly empty gin bottle, spilling some of the remaining liquor on the bedroom's gold shag carpeting. He looked at the bottle and the wet stain next to it. Well, it wouldn't be the last stain in his life, he thought. He shook the pack encouraging one of the remaining cigarettes to pop out the opening torn into a corner of the top. Once enough of it was protruding, he put the cigarette up to his lips and sleepily pulled it out. He could almost feel the cool drag of smoke that would soon bring reality back to his senses. A little more fumbling on the nightstand, and he retrieved a book of matches. As he opened them, he noticed they were strangely soggy. He had a vision of them falling into the toilet the night before, as well as the remembrance of his scheme to dry them out overnight. With little hope, he pulled one limp, gray-headed cardboard match out and dragged it along the lighting strip. The head crumbled off without even a sulfurous-smelling spark. He let the cigarette drop from his mouth onto the floor along with the gin bottle. All right, he conceded to no one in particular. I'll quit. He pulled himself up with a groan as much as with his muscles. A tear in his dirty t-shirt revealed a portion of his pot belly. He noted he had slept in his pants and was still wearing his socks. He barely remembered Gina helping to pull off his shoes. How had he let himself get so drunk last night? They were supposed to be celebrating her birthday, and he had promised himself to go easy on the booze. Obviously, he had broken one more promise to himself and to Gina. She had met him when his life made more sense. Jake had been there for her when she was recovering from an attack by a mugger that nearly claimed her life, and he knew she felt an obligation to help him as he struggled with his own life-altering tragedy. 
He wondered how much longer she would hang around, waiting for him to get things back together. Whereas Gina's injuries affected her mostly physically, Jake's were purely psychological. At times, he hoped she would leave him. With the last remnant of his former life gone, nothing would stop him from sliding completely into his own self-destruction. Maybe Gina knew that. A year ago, things were quite different. Jake was on top of the world. His career was taking off, and he was even considering proposing to Gina. Jake was a sports agent. He wasn't quite Jerry Maguire. He didn't set up Tiger Woods with Nike or Michael Jordan with Gatorade. He worked with a lower caliber of athletes. But he had a talent for finding unknown sports figures and pairing them with an endorsement that fit them to a T. He connected Al Gregory, a beach volleyball star, with an L.A. laser eye surgery clinic. The result? A 300% increase in surgery appointments in one week from two $500 a month billboards on Venice Beach, tripling the money Al had been taking home on the volleyball circuit. Then there was Mona Dirk, the bowler. Not an attractive woman, but she allowed a local Duluth, Minnesota microbrewery, Lewis Grand Brewery, to enter the bowling alley market with their brands. The deal effectively quadrupled overall sales within three months, requiring the brewery to double their production facilities and crediting Mona as the Lewis Grand Brewery savior. Over the last year, however, he hadn't signed a single new client. To be honest, he hadn't really tried. He'd even let his top existing clients jump to other agents when his apathy worried them enough to sever their ties. The agency he worked for, Frazier and Frakes, would have fired him long ago if his friend and boss, Jonathan Jones, hadn't convinced them to give him time to recover from the Finley account. When Jake's savings had run out and his commissions had dried up, Jonathan had advanced him some cash, enough to keep up his rent and his drinking. But Jake knew that wouldn't last much longer. Jonathan was a good friend, but he couldn't keep risking his career in the hopes Jake would get back to where he was. It had been a long year, but not long enough to cleanse the guilt Jake held on to. He had found a skateboarding phenom named Brad Finley, a high school senior who was Jake's ticket to bigger and better things. When a photo shoot for a Nike ad ended up with the teenager paralyzed from the waist down, Jake blamed himself. Brad's parents blamed him too, and their lawsuit against Nike was like a nail in Jake's coffin. The ringing phone shattered his head like a piece of glass. He snapped out of his self-destructive reminiscence and checked to see if the answering machine was on. Then he remembered he had broken it a week earlier, when a spilled can of beer had shorted it out. Jake fell back on the bed and pulled a pillow tight over his head. The muffled sound persisted. He counted twenty rings before starting to think that maybe someone was really interested in getting through to him. He sat up and tried one more time to shake the cobwebs out of his brain. He took a deep breath and let it out as he picked up the phone. Fisher, he answered. Thought you were dead, Jake, said the voice on the other end. I'll get back to you on that, he answered, recognizing Jonathan Jones' voice on the other end. Well, I hope you're not, because I have something for you. Jake sat up a little straighter. Something? Jake, I need to know you can get back in the game. It's been a year, buddy. You have to do something. I don't know, answered Jake. He was sure Jonathan didn't want to hear that, but he wanted to be truthful with his friend. It's right up your alley. Frakes has a big client looking to find a different face to sell their product. They feel that having an overpaid professional isn't as appealing to the masses as they'd like. They want an unknown, a rising star who will get rich and famous because he uses their product. Who are we talking about? asked Jake in confusion. The client or the athlete? Either. The client is Callaway. The golf guy is Callaway? asked Jake. The golf guy is Callaway, answered Jonathan. They are looking for Cinderella. I don't suppose you have a glass slipper. 
Andrew Patterson. Who? Exactly. He's the top-rated amateur golfer in northern Illinois, perhaps the whole state. He took up the sport two years ago and has won every tournament he's played in. Supposed to be a real character as well. So Callaway wants him? He's playing in the Northern Illinois Amateur Regional Golf Tournament. The winner gets to play in the next Pro-Am. You sign him up, and we write him to a $500,000 contract when and if he turns pro. If? He will. He's been shooting towards this goal for two years, perfecting his game, advancing in the rankings. No one's thought to sign him yet? No one but us knows Callaway is looking to go this direction. Sounds too easy, commented Jake. I need to know I can count on you. I spent an hour convincing Frakes you were the guy to do it. That would snap you out of your slump. Believe it or not, he still remembers the Jake Fisher from a year ago and is willing to give you a shot at it. When is the tournament? That's the thing. It starts in an hour. I tried calling last night and your machine isn't picking up. Anyway, it's at the George W. Dunn National Golf Course. An hour? Yeah, it's uh, down in Oak Forest, so you need to get moving. There will be credentials for you at the starter's table. Jonathan paused for a moment. Jake, I gotta ask. Jonathan started. I know, and I'm all right now, but a few hours ago it would have been questionable. Please do this, Jake. It may be your last chance. Jake felt a spark of determination ignite in him. If he could do this, he'd no longer be disappointing Jonathan and Gina, the two people who loved him dearly and whom he loved as well. Screwing up might be the last straw for Gina, and that would be the last straw for him. He kindled the spark and let a small flame begin to warm his resolve. I'll be there, Jonathan, he promised. Jake started to hang up the phone, but quickly put it back to his ear. Jonathan. Yeah, buddy? Thanks. Nice to have you back. Nice to be back. Thank you for listening to A Really Good Day, a novel by James Hosek, narrated by Rich Hosek. If you are interested in purchasing a hardcover edition of this story for yourself or a golfer in your life, visit jimbooks.myshopify.com. You'll get free shipping in the United States. You'll also get the complete audiobook and ebook editions with your purchase. And make sure to subscribe to the mailing list for updates about the upcoming release of his Doctor at Mystery series. Cozy Mysteries About a Crime-Solving Veterinarian. Thanks again, and all the very best.